Hey, go to www.howardforran.com and get a copy of my new book, Uncomplicate Business. I went through every monthly column I had written from 1994 to 2015, and I looked at those columns and realized that in business, you only manage three things, people, time, and money. So I stripped out all the dental and wrote a book that could take any business to the next level. I don't care if you're a dairy farmer, own a restaurant, you're a plumber, this book is for you. Pre-order my book now. Get your copy at howardforran.com It is a great honor today to be interviewing a legend, Dr. Dennis Smiler. We're both here live at the 11th Annual Megagen Symposium uh, in New York City at the Grand Hyatt. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, giving me an hour of your time. Um, You're you, welcome. You, um, you have every honorary thing I know. I mean, you're an oral surgeon. You're a diplomat of everything. Um, I, I want to answer your question. Uh, first thing is, um, next month, this is late April, next month, 5,000 kids are going to graduate from 56 dental schools in the United States. They know that um, implants are exploding. Um, should they be thinking about adding the placement of implant to their curriculum if they're 25 years old should they be thinking someday they'll be placing implants like you what would advice would you give them oh i think it's goes without doubt that they're going to be placing implants and the future of doing implant dentistry really rests with the general practitioner the proviso to that is that you have to have that general practitioner that stays within their comfort zone and stays within their experience level. If you've interviewed people like Jack Krauser or Mike Picos and those of us that started doing implants back in the late 70s, there were times we went to meetings where people wouldn't sit with us because that was voodoo. Now this has become the state of the art. The problem is, is that in most dental schools you get a smattering of a little education in this, a little education in that, and they train you 90% of the time for what you might do 10% of your time in practice. So my advice to a young graduate is to pick a few of postgraduate courses or the academy meetings and gain the experience for placing implants. And when they do, they should stay within that comfort zone. Be more specific, what, if you just graduated um, to next month, to the last five years, and you said, someday I want to place my first implant. Where exactly, specifically, would you start? Well, if I'm just graduating, I'm probably going through a whole period of just anxiety of where I want to <laughs> set up that practice. So the idea of where I want to be in five years is a little bit difficult. But like most things in life, you end up with a five-year plan. You sit in front of you a, a compass and a map to decide where you want to go. And if that's where you want to do, that's what you want to do, then it's a matter of finding the educational programs to do that. I would join places like the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, the International Congress of Oral Implantologists, where you run into colleagues that are very happy to share you know, that information. And then pick a mentor that you do. You know, to become excellent in any field, to become a master in any field, you first have to know the theory. And after you've digested the theory, that leads you then to practice. And then you have to combine the theory with the practice to decide what cases you can do, how to stay within that comfort zone, treat the patients, and then with time you become a master. But only by developing the time and effort for the educational courses. Uh, many of the implant companies will provide you with courses on how to do their particular implant, which is fine. Most implants in the present day market work. I'm specifically more involved with one or two implant systems that I think are excellent. But when you do the implants, you have to stay within the biologic limits of the patient. And if you fall outside of that, that's when you get into trouble. So for the new graduate, it's a matter of finding a mentor who knows not only the easy way of just drilling a hole in the bone, 
but to also understand the how, when, how that you want to do this. Let's uh, let's um, back up to the very beginning. I think um, the biggest difference when I um, placed my first symbol in 1987 to now is you and I grew up on two-dimensional X-ray. And we'd have a pano and think we had an inch of bone and you'd flap it back and it was like a little piece of paper. Now there's 3D x-rays. Has, has going from 2D to 3D affected your implantology career? Well, the simple answer is yes. And if you go back to that dental student that's graduating, I sit here with a smile because going to dental school, uh, we didn't have high speed units. And when we did third molar extractions, we did a mallet, mallet and chisel. It's, so I graduated a little bit beyond the time where we had covered wagons. But then <laughs> after that, you know, everything sort of took off. And in the beginning when you and I were doing implants, it's true, we had periapical x-rays, we had panographic x-rays, which were two-dimensional. Then enter the scene with CT scans. And then that graduated to volumetric CT scans. So at this moment, using a CT scan for diagnosis and treatment planning is not a state of the art. But in practice, it really should be the state of the art for every dentist that is doing implants because it gives you a three-dimensional picture of the receptor site, the quality and quantity of bone, and the anatomic structures before we do any surgery. So it takes the guesswork out of most of this. Now, um, to the dentist that's been out there five or ten years is thinking about buying one of these machines, uh, they're, they're huge investments. Are there any particular machines that you like or anything you like more than others? Well, you know, Ogden Nash had a poem, you know, the difference between men and boys or the price of their toys. <laughs> so when I first started, I like that. Yeah, well, <laughs> So wanting to be the first on the block, I did get a CT scan, was a flatbed CT scan, and almost led to divorce, that we spent 200 and some thousand dollars for a scan. But it's so influenced the way we practice. So the idea that having a CT scan that will increase for the doc, for the dentist, a revenue stream is going to pay for that scan in a very short period of time. What type of scan to get? Well, let's see, I've used the Vatec machine, I've used the iTech machine, uh, the iCAT. Um, you just have to be familiar with that. I wouldn't rush out to do it because once you make that type of capital investment, it's not that you can't change, but the problem of reinvesting that type of revenue to buy another machine is ridiculous. So I certainly would do my homework. Okay, now you practice in LA. Correct. Where, where, whereabouts in LA? That's a, that's almost a country. Well, it's in San Fernando Valley area, and it's um, out of practice also, in in West Los Angeles, which is outside of Beverly Hills for a while. Now, what if a general dentist in that area wanted to send you for just a CBCT? Do you charge a referring dentist for a CBCT? Do you think, or do you? Is that a Is that a, something you do for your referrals? Hmm. That's, does that ever come up? No, it does come up, and there are some legal questions about that. The Star Clause. Um, the Star Clause. The Star Clause. So that if, is that a California law? Or no, no, no. Law? It's a national law. So that if if a private practitioner is setting themselves up to take CT scans for another entity, there are certain requirements they're going to have to fulfill. Uh, I would do it as a courtesy, and we would do that as a courtesy. I think more to the point is that you want to find a surgeon that you like to work with, a surgeon that you have a relationship with. Now, anything in life, whether or not it's selling insurance or selling houses or doing implants or finding patients, it's all a matter of relationships. So the first thing I would do is make sure you have a good relationship. When I was very much in the private practice, we had our study club that ran for over 40 years. and. Dentists would then take my courses. They would come to me and ask me to put these implants in. I would look at the case with them and I would say, doctor, whatever their name is, you don't need me. You can do this case. Be well trained, get more experience and stay within the comfort zone. What most people don't understand is that axiom that a rising tide 
raises all ships. So that if you have a referral base that you've developed, I'm talking to the, to the specialist now, and you help them understand what they can be doing, not only will they send you more patients, but more patients are going to be becoming aware of implants, which they are now, and more patients are going to want to require implants. And then there are definitely surgical procedures that really should be left, if not to the specialists by themselves, or to the GP that has a great deal of experience. Um, I want to... I want to um, ask you about something that uh, just happened recently. You don't have to answer any of these questions if you don't like if they're too politically incorrect. What 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 is what is general dentists to think when they see one of the largest dental companies or like Danaher buy a low priced implant system like Implants Direct and a high priced implant system like Novaco? Is that? I mean, is there are all Im, are implants? All, you started with all implants systems basically work. Why, why would a company buy the, uh, a Mercedes and a low cost? Is there that much difference in the value, longevity? Well, go back to your question of po politically correct. I come from Los Angeles where everything is politically correct. <laughs> I mean, it's, we can't even go into a bar now without buying a drink and calling it a politically correct uh, entity. To your question, quality usually is the same as what you would buy, not necessarily for the expense, but let me give you an example. Uh, you can go to the outlet stores and uh, go to Neiman Marcus. Well, the clothes that they have at a Neiman Marcus outlet store is not the same group of clothes that you're going to find at Neiman Marcus. If you go and get an implant from a knockoff you know, company, you have to make darn sure that all those parts and pieces are going to fit properly, that there's going to be good connections between the abutment and or the implants. Because what you're doing, what the clinician is doing, they are really taking the patient's money and they're providing a service. You have to be very careful that the service you provide is absolutely excellent. So you want to start off with excellent parts. I don't drive a Mercedes, but if I did, I would certainly want parts and pieces, you know, to fit the Mercedes and not something that I would get from a third world company, a uh, country. Okay. Um, we keep hearing, um, a lot about, uh, I, I guess the holy grail in implant dentistry would be immediate load. I mean, how nice would it be to just place the implant and put the tooth on top? Will you talk about when, um, immediate load, um, is, you know, is, what what percent of the implants you place are immediate load? Um, when, when is that an indication? Is ours, or when is that not so much a good idea? Immediate load is a nice little catchword that's put out by the various implant companies in order to sell product. At the other end of that product is a patient. That patient has bone and has an implant. And there is just a biologic phases of healing that you cannot circumvent. So immediate load does work, but you need certain parameters. You have to have an implant that is initially stable, that stays stable. You have to understand that stability of the implant is not the same as having an implant osseo-integrated. As a matter of fact, if you have just a conical shape implant that you place, you place the implant on day one, in two or three weeks, that implant is less stable than the day you put it in. And the reason for that is, is that the biology is such that you have these uh, osteoclastic cells. These are vacuum cleaner type of cells, multinucleated giant cells. And they come in and they clean up all of the microscopic debris between the implant and the bone. So that space opens up. Then over the ensuing two, three, four months, however it takes, and that quality of bone becomes integrated. If you have an implant, say for instance, the Megagen system with, with that type of fin design that resists loading, and you can measure this, that it maintains its initial stability over the 30 or 40 weeks, then it is stable while it is becoming integrated. 
Now the second or third phases of this is that that implant cannot be under load that is beyond the physiologic limits of healing. Mm -hmm. So if you put the implant in and you immediately put it under full load, then you retard the healing of bone. So you may have immediate placement, immediate load for aesthetics. I'd be a little bit careful of placing an implant complete for immediate load, say for a single crown restoration. If you're doing this with a bar system overdenture, where you have a number of implants that are maintaining a bar and the restoration uh, rests on that, that might be a different story. So go to um, your practice, or maybe, um, or maybe not your practice, but a typical oral surgeon. Are you mostly <coughs> doing um, single implants to replace a single tooth extracted, or are you mostly um, working with removable dentures and doing multiple implant cases? I mean, what percent is full mouth implant, removable, fixed reconstruction versus single tooth replacement in the American market today? Well, I think in the American market today, the single tooth implant would be uh, endodontic failure. It might be the younger population where you're losing one or two teeth. Someone is in the neighborhood of, say, 20, 30, 40 years of age. As you get up to about 50, 60, 70, when patients are coming to you with loss of teeth and loss of bone, uh, that becomes more of a specialty type of practice. You know, the only reason for bone to be there is to support the teeth. So when the teeth are extracted, the bone slowly melts away. Now, most of the patients then would come with almost fully edentulous mandible or maxilla would have to be have placed five or six implants. Those implants can usually be done as immediate load. But there are some provisos with this. My father was a carpenter. Uh, in fact, I use the same instruments he does, but it was just smaller. To fit the mouth. But this is not rocket science. All we have here is a beam or struts and a beam that's set upon those two struts. So what you need to do in implant dentistry is to avoid stress on the implant. Stress is then transmitted to the bone. The bone then resorbs and you might end up having failure. So if you're going to avoid stress, you have to either decrease the force that you have on the prosthetic design, the implants, or the bar system, or you increase the design of the implant, the surface area, either by putting in many more implants or by having an implant that is wide or long. And we now know that the diameter of the implant is more important for conserving bone than is the length of the implant. So if you place implants strategically in an arch form to decrease the amount of deflection that you would have on a beam between implants, then you've increased the amount of implants, you've decreased the stress, and you'll end up with more success. So are you, um, are you using software to help you pick the um, placement of the implant, the, 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 the length and width of the implant? Almost all of the implants that I now do are done with information we gathered from a CT scan on a software program. And what is important about this is that whatever implant system you're using, and most of us have our favorite that we like to use, the proviso is, is that we need to have circumferentially around the implant about a millimeter to a millimeter, mid millimeter and a half of bone. If you don't have a millimeter and a half of bone circumferentially around the implant, that implant puts stresses on the cortical bone at the crest. The bone is very thin, has a very poor blood supply, and is the first type of bone that is resorbed. So my admonition is that no matter what implant system you're using, don't pick the implant for the amount of crown that you want to place. For instance, in a molar, you want to put a wide diameter implant. Those days are gone. You want to place an implant that relates to the quality and the quantity of receptor bone. So you're looking at the bone width and the quality. 
an interesting story is about 25 years ago, placing implants when I did not know what I was doing, I put small diameter implants in to support bicuspid and molar teeth. Patient comes back, and on the contralateral side, knowing now what we got from our scientists that were doing finite element analysis and our research people saying that we should put in wide implants for the load, we put in wide implants. The bone around the wide implants fails because we encroach on that cortical plate. The reason that the engineers didn't figure this out is because on their analysis, they were using this all as if it were cancelled bone and didn't take into account that we have that thin cortical bone. So stay with the axiom of maintaining that millimeter, millimeter, or millimeter and a half circumferentially around the implant and you'll be okay. So back in the day when we started, um, all the implants were covered with um, HA and a lot of that was starting to come off. Uh, is the days of coated implants gone? Is it more about shape than coating? No, well, this both. I'm, I'm sighing because the one of the best coatings that we had on an implant was a high quality hydroxylapatite coating on an implant. The phrase there is high quality one that had a high crystalline structure, one that was adapted to the implant, and we had bio-integration. And that was an excellent, excellent coating. That went by the wayside mostly because of trying to develop studies in which we were able to um, have machines that would give us a good thin coating that would be biologic. and got us into the titanium, into the different various amount of coatings. What you're looking at now is the development and coatings on an implant with a roughened type of surface. The reason for the roughened surface that you'll find with, for instance, the Megagen system is that when you place this in the bone, one of the first things that happens is that you get these collagen fibrils that attach to bone. If you don't have a roughened surface, these fibrils then, in during healing, detach from the surface. The problem is, is that these fibrils are a pathway onto which your cells and the osteoblasts go in order to form bone. So you need that as a web. So the surface of the implant, the type of surface we have is very important. Now are you also, um, when you place it as drawing blood and centrifuging, and can you talk about that? Yes. On like what percent of your case? I mean, is that something routine or just under special needs or? It, drawing blood and spinning the blood down is a very, very simple process. And I would recommend that the general practitioner and the surgeon out there who's periodontist, that they do this almost every case. Um, it has advantages when you're bone grafting and it has advantages also in, in around and placing implants. There are a number of doctors that have used PRP, platelet, um, restored, uh, what is it, platelet, restored plasma, restored platelets that are very, very good. And there's a number of docs that use PRP, then they say it doesn't work at all. The problem is they're asking the wrong question, that the platelet practice of spinning this down and gaining that only acts on cells. So if you place this in an area, say for instance in the skin where it first started, it works very well because you have lots of cells. If the practitioner is using this, or now what I use is concentrated growth factors, and you place it in an area that has a lot of cancellous bone where a number of cells, it works. If you place it in an area where there is mostly cortical bone, where you have very little cancellous bone, therefore you have very a diminished amount of cells, it doesn't work as well. And that's why those of us that are doing a lot of bone grafting know that if we graft in the maxilla, where there is a large amount of cancellous type of bone, our success goes way up. If we're grafting in the posterior mandible, where the cancellous compartment is less and we have more cortical bone, our success goes down. It has a little bit to do with the practitioner. 
It has a little bit to do with the material we're using. It has a lot to do with the receptor site. So to go back to your initial question, when we were talking about CT scans, the other thing the CT scan does is give us a quantitative measurement as well as qualitative of cancellous bone versus cortical bone. The more cancellous bone, the greater your success. So not only does it give you a measurement of what diameter of implant to do, it also tells you what type of bone grafting procedure you're going to do. So do you, is there any CT scan and CT, uh, 3D x-ray machines and software that you like? If there's a dentist out there, kind of my motto is that with dentaltown.com, no dentist has to practice solo again. So I know there's dentists out there listening saying, come on, dude, what, if I was going to buy one 3D x-ray machine, which one would you get? Uh, I think I would get something like the Vatec machine. I think that's an excellent machine. The Vatec? Vatec. Uh, V-A-T-E-C-H, I think. Who makes that? Mm, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, a lot of times, if you ask me what kind of instruments we use, you have to ask my nurse. Right. They just give it to me. I don't know. Right. That the important part here also is the software package. Mm -hmm. Many of the implant companies come with their own software package. The software that I prefer is one that comes from Anatomage. I think that is probably one of the more excellent software packages out there. Now that's just a software, are they affiliated with a 3D machine, Anatomage? Well, no, it's not that they're affiliated with a 3D machine. The raw data that every CT machine uses is called DICOM, has the, the suffix DICOM, dot D-C-O-M. That's the raw data. So any machine is going to give you the DICOM raw data that you can then take and put that into any software package that you want. Now, there are different softwares that give you greater or lesser bells and whistles to use, and that's why I like the Anatomage program. Do you know the owner of that or where they're at? I think they're in the Sacramento or San Francisco area. Because I, I, everybody talks about that on Dentaltown. Animage. Do they? Yeah, it seems like be one of the favorites on Dentaltown. It's one that I use almost on every case. Uh, I should track them down and do a podcast with those guys. So, so back to this general dentist. I'm, I'm going to go back. So, um, this general dentist is uh, driving to work and he's got to extract 29. What should he be thinking about if the patient someday is not getting an implant today? Today is just an extraction, but someday you may get an implant. Should a general dentist be routinely bone grafting? extraction sites if they're going to go back later and place them and talk about what we should be thinking about when we pull an individual to to help it help increase its chance of being receiving an implant later down the road well the simple answer is yes every time now what happens is is that as soon as you take out a tooth if you don't restore the bone or give something in there you're going to immediately lose height and width of bone so you will have less bone in that site a week, two weeks, three weeks later than you had initially. So what you are able to do at the time of the extraction is put in a graft material that's going to not only preserve the site, but also give you back new bone. So a socket graft is the simplest, easiest, least expensive way to preserve the bone and the efficacy of forming new bone is superb. Okay, now you're in California. Would Delta Insurance cover a procedure like that? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. And and what would you be graphing it with? Um, talk about different products uh, from low cost to high cost. I mean, well, the easiest product that would I think one could use that is very inexpensive is a product of calcium sulfate. It's um, I think runs about sixty dollars to eighty dollars, maybe in a in a two gram package, I'm somewhere around that price. And in a small socket area, like a lower central incisor, you could use the calcium sulfate material. The nice thing about this material is that you could mix it with saline or mix it with an aqueous antibiotic and form it almost like a putty. So you could form this material in doing third molar extractions and greatly reduce the amount of dry sockets that you might have.
because it helps form a And who makes socket. this putty? Um, Dentogen, uh, Orthogen, I think, is the uh, manufacturer in New York. No, Jersey, in New Jersey, makes Orthogen. this. They also have a product called Nanogen, which is calcium sulfate, and has nanoparticles in it, and it retards the resorption of the material. It's an important concept. If the graph material resorbs too quickly, it doesn't stay there as a matrix to form new bone. So if you use a calcium sulfate material or any material that resorbs very quickly, for instance, say in a sinus graft, and come back three months later, you'll have no bone. You need a material that's going to stay there, slowly resorb, and as it is resorbing, is going to be replaced by the patient's own bone. And speaking of resorbing, do you use resorbable sutures, or do you use silk and have them come back and take them out? Well, my preference, let me spend just a another minute or two with the grafting. Please, please. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, <laughs> because there are a couple concepts here. In my practice, I prefer to use a graft material that resorbs. I do not advocate a non-resorbable material. The I want the material, the matrix, to resorb and then be replaced by the patient's own bone. The other problem that doctors get into when they're doing socket grafts is that they pack the material in too tight almost like they're doing an amalgam restoration. And if they put in so much of this material, you reduce the spaces between the particles so you don't have any space left for angiogenesis, for nutrient supply to come into the graft. So the technique is to have a loose compaction. More is not better. You want a very, very loose compaction. Um, if you have a socket that's open, now you can use a membrane on top of that if you need to. Uh, there are enough collagen membranes that are out there, or the one that I use is that I'll draw blood, use concentrated growth factors, and press the little area and make it into its own membrane and use that. Now, do you have any of these procedures filmed on videos or anybody, a dentist, could watch you do that? Do you? Yes. Um, I've given all of the videos that I've made, a number of them, to... I think it's called View Medi, or Medica. Mm -hmm. um, and if they go onto the internet and they just knock in Smiler or View Medica, they'll just see a number of videos. How long ago did you give them those videos? Oh, I think about a year ago, six months ago. It's been up on the web a number of times. Yeah. Any, or, any chance we could um, talk to those guys, see if we can put them on Dental Town? Or? Well, not only that, I can just send you all the videos and you can put them on Dental Town. I would love that. I oh. would absolutely love that. Easy, easy. Now, if you go back to your question about the sutures, the best suture material is, I think, is one that is non-resorbable. It's monofilament that is very little in tissue reaction. That's the good news. The bad news is, is that if it's non-resorbable, you have to take it out. The other bad news is that these materials are usually very stiff, almost like fishing line. So if you take that type of suture and you put it in even with a very, very small knot, very often the patient may come back with a small ulcer where they have some irritation. If you're using resorbable material like Vicryl or gut suture material, you have to remember that it resorbs via an inflammatory reaction. So if you have a patient with good oral hygiene that can keep the hygiene down, keep, make sure that there's very little debris around the implants, then you can keep that graft, I mean that suture in place for 10 days, two weeks. Most often, patients don't do very well with hygiene. And then what you have is a lot of debris around where your, where your sutures are. So my preference is a non-resorbable suture something like maybe a four row ethicon or proline and make a very very short knot so what, what are the things a lot of the dentists have a hard time putting their hands on is um one of the people who most likely need an implant are also usually the ones most likely um shouldn't have one um, they're smokers they're obese they're diabetics they're alcoholics they don't brush, they don't floss, they don't go to the dentist. I mean, so how do you as a surgeon, and you've seen 30-year follow-ups, um, 
you know, obviously, if you're a hygienist, you're not ever going to need an implant. You're a brusher, you're a flosser, you're, you know, you, you do everything perfect. But it ends up the people that land on your doorstep, they're not perfect. So how do you risk someone who shows up if they're a smoker, a diabetic, um, they're an alcoholic, they're, they don't brush and floss, or they're hillbillies from where I grew up in Kansas. How do you determine whether they're a candidate or not? Well, the first thing I need to know is they came into the office. So 90% of them are candidates, otherwise they wouldn't be in the office. And I think for the young doc and for the experienced doc out there, there has to be that dialogue that not only is the patient thinking whether or not they want that doctor to do the case, the doctor has to think, do I want to do that case? On the n number of times, now I have to tell you, I've been in practice 45 years, so there have been some times where we've ended up with negative malpractice cases. And every case, there, if I think back, I would have Jiminy Cricket sitting on my shoulder going, don't do this. <laughs> but we have our own ego and we can do everything. And I would, the admonishment that I would give to the young practitioner is that it is not your job to do every case. So patients who come in who are diabetic, who have AIDS, who uh, are under cancer treatment, uh, have some other metabolic conditions, these are relative contraindications. How well are they controlled? You have to do this in concert you know, with a physician. Certainly these are patients over the years I've treated, even patients who smoke. We have a huge informed consent that they sign three or four pages, which outlines their diagnosis, their treatment planning, what we suggest for treatment, the alternatives. They don't have to do implants, so you have to tell your patients the alternatives. And there's a large paragraph also on smoking. Now, even though they sign, and even though they promise they're going to be good for their diet, and they promise that they're gonna end up and do better with their hygiene. A lot of times they don't. Every time they don't. And the important thing is, is that they come back and it is our fault. They will not take responsibility for it, which goes back to the original comment that you have to do an evaluation and pick that patient that you want to do. Young doc, you want to go after the low, low hanging fruit. You know, you have a a cardiac surgeon that goes in and does cardiac surgery and the patient lives for five years and the family gathers around at the funeral and says, thank you doctor for keeping the patient alive. You know, our father, our cousin or whoever and we certainly appreciate it. In dentistry, the doc does a crown and bridge restoration and it fails in five years, they want their money back. So again, it goes back to pick that patient that you want to do. And you'll slowly learn what cases are within your comfort zone and which cases are not. And if that doc, young doc going out into practice, is going to meetings like this, they have to go to three, four meetings a year. And it'll turn out that if they go to a meeting, they listen to the various speakers. If they pick up three or four pearls at a particular meeting, it's worth going to. Every meeting that I go to, there are a few pearls that you pick up. What percent of general dentists in America, there's 30,000 specialists, about 10,000 orthodontists, 5,000 oral surgeons. There's 120,000 general dentists. What percent of those general dentists are placing implants today? Whether, like, just say one a year or more. I think the last statistic was less than 10%. Right. So, Something like that. So 90% of the people listening to you right now on iTunes and YouTube and Dental Town, they're, they're not going to ever place one implant. But one of the things they're always um, looking at, they're always wondering about is, uh, what does it deal with the sinus lift? And what if the sinus comes down is only like two millimeters of bone? And some, some it, just talk about sinus lifts. When, when you lift up that sinus and put a bunch of bone there, is that is that gonna hold? Is that gonna work? And I'm talking about from the diagnosing and treatment planning. This dentist is looking at a, a bite wing, the tooth's been gone forever, it's all sinus. How, how good of a sight is that for an implant? Got it. Now, let me go back to one of the, the right before that when you're talking about that dentist just placing a single implant and just getting started with that a dentist who is placing for instance there was a study done on this say less than 10 implants a year their patients end up having more post-operative problems than say someone who is placing 
100 implants a year. But then if that patient is on prophylactic surgical antibiotics two hours before you do a surgical procedure, the postoperative inflammatory infectious reaction are almost equal. So it's a multifactorial process of whether or not you're placing one or multiple implants. I would recommend in my practice, and I would recommend to anyone out there, that that patient receives surgical prophylaxis. So if I have someone that comes in just for a simple extraction, that patient will receive either 2,000 milligrams of penicillin or 600 milligrams of cleosin, say two hours before we do the procedure. So I have the antibiotic going through the system before I make the bone cut. Now, depending on whether it's a simple surgery, that's all I'm going to do is surgical prophylaxis. If it's a compromised patient, like we talked about before with a metabolic disease, or uh, someone who is on chemotherapy, someone who's diabetic, or in a case where you're only placing a few implants a year, you know, and I may, or a surgical, complicated surgical procedure, I may keep that patient on antibiotics for a longer period of time. For instance, in the sinus lift. In the sinus procedure, and we started doing sinus lifts back in the late 70s, early 80s, I think the first paper I wrote on the sinus lift was about 79, 1978. If you have about at least five millimeters of alveolar bone, the magic number being five, if you have five millimeters of alveolar bone, then I would suggest you have enough bone to put the implant and do the sinus lift at the same time. If you don't, then I would do the sinus lift procedure, wait three or four months, and then put your implants in. Now, depending on the graft material that you're using and the ancillary material like stem cells or uh, concentrated growth factors, in three to four months when you're placing the implants, this is not bone. It is turning into bone. But the biology of bone is that it's going to take 40 to 50 weeks for that bone to become mineralized. So you could put the graft in. This is now on your patient that has, say, only two, three millimeters of, of alveolar bone. Put your graft in, wait three to four months, put your implant in, and wait an additional six months. So now your bone graft has healed for nine, 10 months and your implants within the graft is healing in about that four to five months. And remember that that interface is a very immature woven bone. So you have to treat that bone very gently with your restorative procedures to turn that into a more dense lamellar kind of bone. You know, the axiom I would suggest is the, uh, the phrase, the slower I go, the faster I get there. And if you try to do things too fast, like putting implants in in bone that's very less of alveolar ridge with the graft. And if you have a failure, now you've lost the graft, you've lost the implants, you have a patient that is not very happy with you. So I would back off and say, let's do this slower and make sure we have a success. Now I want to go back to diagnosing and transplanting. What, again, the, um, the people who need the most implants have the worst condition. So we're reading that if you have, um, you lost a tooth from gum disease, you're more likely to have periimplantitis. Will you talk about gum disease and, um, and how it's different around teeth versus implants and what a general dentist should be thinking about when you, you're losing two teeth because you have gum disease, you still have a full mouth of a, of a perio, are you a candidate for two implants there or do we need to remove all the teeth for, you know, talk, talk about Periimplantitis. Well, let's go back. You know, when I was in dental school in the, in the uh, early 1960s, we had courses on perioprost where everything we did was in order to save teeth. And we de developed the prosthetic procedure to try to save marginal teeth. That's all changed. Because if you have a tooth that's marginalized, that's loose, it's almost like a hydraulic pump of organisms, endotoxins going into bone. So the 
point is you'll have less bone in that area next week than you have right now. So the process has changed that we don't do as much perioprost trying to salvage marginal or failing teeth. We now take those teeth out, do a soccer graft, preserve the bone. Then you can place the implants and do your prosthetic reconstruction. You have to remember that periodontitis is a disease of cementum. Titanium doesn't have any cementum around it. So once you take the teeth out and you clean up the mouth, implants do very well on those patients that have periodontal disease, providing they have oral hygiene, they are not metabolically you know, compromised, they do very well. So, so you're, you're confident when a, a person has generalized perio and has been on three month recall for the last 10 years, loses one tooth, that you can place an implant in between two teeth that have been needed to have three month recall for the last five years. Again, the uh, operative word there was confident. And the uh, short answer is no, I'm not confident. If they have generalized periodontal disease and all we're talking about is a single tooth, you have to remember that as soon as you purse your lips together, you have a closed environment. So your loose tooth that you're taking out may be on the upper white right quadrant, but you have gross periodontal disease on the left side. That patient is now laden with bacteria once they close their mouth. So that patient has to be cleaned up. You need to do debridement, you have to salvage the teeth that can be salvaged, and you have to remove the teeth that cannot be salvaged. So what do you, um, I also want to ask you about um, some of these systems we're seeing today, um, following up on the Paralene, some of these systems we see today where people will put uh, four implants, they'll connect them by a bar. So, some people don't think those are as hygienic and easy to clean as other attachment systems. Um, ball, um, balls, um, something more cleansable. We, we talk about if, if a person is a perio patient, um, are there some removable denture systems that are more cleansable than others? Well, if you have. Do you think that's a big factor? Well, I think hygiene, post operative hygiene, is extremely important. Uh, on those patients, my recommendation is that we do a bar system over denture appliance where you would put in a number of implants, connect that with a bar, and then do the, that would be a primary bar, make a secondary bar that fits on top of that primary bar, and do the prosthetic reconstruction on that secondary bar. What that means is, is that when that is in the mouth, it is firm and stable. The patient can chew corn on the cob and spare ribs without a problem. In the evening, they can take out the appliance, brush their teeth, brush around the bar, brush around all the implants, put the appliance back and go to sleep. And then in the morning, the same thing you and I do is go in the morning, we brush our teeth, they would wake up, take that system out, brush, and then put it back for the rest of the day. That works. I think where we end up with a compromise is where the patient wants to have something that is non-removable and we try to make a space between the prosthesis and the gingival portion of the alveolar ridge, and they have difficulty cleaning. If they have difficulty cleaning, then they develop inflammatory reaction, the sulcus around the implant becomes traumatized, endotoxins from bacteria, loss of tissue, loss of bone, loss of the implant. So what we're supposed to do as clinicians is to give the patient what they need, not necessarily what the patient wants and everyone wants to go back to what they looked 20, 30 years ago. I would love to go back to what I, how I looked 20, 30 years ago, but you're not gonna do that. So be careful of the patient that comes in with pictures of how they looked when they were in their teens or 20s and say, this is what I want you to do. That's not gonna happen. So you have to decide what the patient needs. And if the patient's wants are way askew to what the patient needs, then I would say run. Don't do that patient, it's going to cause you trouble. Okay, I wanna, I wanna, yeah, if, if a person lost all of their teeth from um, perio and they were edentulous, would you really put your foot down and say, you need to have a full implant removable solution? 
versus if they say lost all their teeth from decay and saying I want to have a full mouth um, reconstruction of implants fixed. Where, where do you weigh in on a, a patient that could have six implants up or six implants lower and two fixed bridges that never come out versus no, you got to be able to take these out and clean around them. Again, you know, it's a nice question, but it goes back to initial treatment planning. And it's just a mat, not a matter of what the patient wants and that you could put the implants in. The best tissue around an implant is attached keratinized tissue. So if you have a healthy patient, a non-smoker, with a lot of good attached keratinized tissue, I'd be more apt to put the implants in and let them wear a fixed case. If it's movable mucosa, the hygiene is not as good. Um, they came to me with a grad of periodontal disease. My suggestion strongly would be a fixed removable type of appliance. Are you still doing many skin grafts to get more attached gingiva? We do, yes, we do some skin grafts, but I'm not doing as many. And why uh, is that? Well, there are other ways of, of doing this, and uh, even with skin grafts themselves, um, I was not much of a favor of doing skin. One reason was is that we end up not only taking the skin, but sometimes the hair follicles and the sebaceous glands. So back in the 70s, I wrote a paper on doing a dermal graft, where we took the dermis, which is pluripotential, placed that into the mouth, and then we ended up getting is new tissue. Um, you could use some of the synthetic materials. You can use palatographs. Periodontists are adept at doing palatographing. Uh, we've used the membranes of concentrated growth factors to do that. But it's all a matter of treatment planning. What is the quality of the recipient tissue that will determine that? Would you say of the um, nine, okay, so when you got out of, when we, you and I got out of school, there were only eight specialties, now there's nine uh, with uh, CBCT or radiology. Would you say that um, the most changing specialty would have to be periodontics? Um, don't, don't you think, don't you see a lot less periodontal surgery and a lot more just going towards extraction and replacing with an implant? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on periodontists and is that a good thing or a bad thing or? Well, if you talk to some of my periodontal friends that we've been doing implants for a long time, they tell me that their practice in periodont very periodontics is going down and they're doing more implants. So implants, I think, is saving the specialty of periodontics, periodontotics. Um, you know, in today's market, for that general practitioner that we talked about earlier, I wouldn't make any decisions about a specialty until you're in practice for about three to four years. There are too many nice things and too many new things that are going on within dentistry that changes so fast that will help make that decision for you. Um, I mean, if I practice surgery the way I did 20, 30 years ago, it'd be antique to what we're now doing. Dennis, there's, um, Dr. Smiley, there's a lot of um, dental students that love these podcasts. They're, they're really into podcasts the most. And uh, what would you say to a junior or a senior uh, dental student who thinks that he, maybe he wants to become an oral surgeon like you? What would you say if your own uh, son or grandson was saying, um, should I become an oral surgeon too, or just be a general dentist or a family dentist? What, what, what are your thoughts there? Hmm. Would you do it all over again? Hmm. It's going to take a thought here in a second or two. <laughs> you got it. And I tell you why. <clears throat> you know, just a little bit a while ago, I said that uh, we're trained in school 90% of what we do 10% of the time. And that really is what we do in surgery. I trained in New York as a surgeon, maxillofacial surgeon. And it was very exciting when I was in my 20s. Manhattan? Or in Manhattan. Wow. Um, so if you walk through Central Park at night, I always took care of you the next day. Um, and that was a nice practice because it made you feel like you were really doing something. That type of trauma of fixing up faces, they got someone who fell in front of a subway train or someone who got shot, shot, you know, gets old very fast. There are docs that love it. And to them, I think God bless. 
and go ahead to spend your four, six, eight years and go into that type of a practice. That doctor as a maxillofacial surgeon belongs in a large practice, um, a trauma center, hospital. But if you're doing office space practice, you have to think about how many truly orthognathic surgeries you're going to be doing. Most of that is going to be dental alveolar. If I were graduating today, which I think was your question, I love being a general practitioner, handling not only the prosthetic phase of this, but getting adept at surgical procedures that would stay within my, my comfort zone. You know, at the time I became a surgeon is because I hated prosthetics. But when you're involved with implants, you need to know more prosthetics than I ever learned when I was in, in dental school. So I, today, I'd like that general practitioner who picks out a course that they want to follow. And if it were implants, I would just devour classes and courses and become, get yourself a mentor to help you and stay with that. I think that's exciting. Well, I hope we get some of your videos up on Dental Town. It's an easy thing to do. Do you, do you have any lectures too? Because no. we, we have a slick system where you just uh, upload the uh, your PowerPoint and then you just call on the phone and do a voiceover or... or uh... No, I don't think I've had anyone take lectures. Although we'll be lecturing tomorrow, so you might, if you want to take that, that's all. Okay. I would, I would love to. Um, you said something that I'm going to follow up on, orthognathic surgery. A lot of general dentists, um, a lot of them kind of get nervous when they're, they send a kid to an orthodontist and the orthodontist says, well, this kid, to do this right, it's going to need orthodontic <coughs> surgery. And we're going to have to advance the mandible or Lafort or something. And people start getting nervous about paresthesias and, and is this overkill? What, what, are, what are your thoughts on orthognathic surgery? And, and, and if your granddaughter... Um, you know, had a weak chin or too much of a gummy smile, would, would you let her have orthognathic surgery or would you say that's too, too many complications and too much risk? I would have them do orthognathic surgery in a heartbeat. Not a question. The question is, who would I have them do it? And there are a few surgeons around the country that I admire that I think are probably some of the finest maxillofacial surgeons. Uh, not necessarily in California, but there might be one or two, and that's who I would, you know, have them do it. Okay, well, name him because this guy listening on the podcast, he's right now. He's in Parsons, Kansas. He has no one. Who who would, who would and, and and they'd put him on a plane for the best. Who oh, would they, who would you go to? Are you doing it? No, no, no. Who, who would you send? Well, if here's you were in Parsons, Kansas, and you were a dentist, and it was your daughter. All right, and you didn't want someone to botch that up. Who who would you fly him to? Well, let's back up a second. Um, I used to be a private pilot and in order to take passengers I would have to fly at least three or four hours a month just to become current. And back in the 70s or 80s when I was doing two or three orthognathic cases a month that was fine to keep my proficiency. I wouldn't, if I were the last maxillofacial surgeon around and there was an emergency, Lafort one or a sagittal split, I guess I could make my way through it. But that's not the point. I want to go to someone who's experienced. So the first thing is, uh, I would pick the doc that I think are the most experienced. Usually the nurses in the operating room knows who the doc to go to. Uh, there are a couple docs in California. Uh, one of the finest maxillofacial surgeons I've ever met was Dr. Wolford, Larry Wolford is in Texas, who I would send anyone to. Which city in Texas? I think Dr. Wolford's in Dallas or Fort Worth, I'm not sure. Spell Wolford. Uh, W-O-L-F-O-R-D. -O -O well, that, that's a good source because at least um, I'm sure, um, if anything, that he would give a recommendation to someone somewhere else if you were... And then, I mean, but if you're in a smaller town or wherever you are and someone recommends orthognathic surgery, there are a couple things I would, I would suggest. That decision has to be made at the beginning of treatment of the patient. If the patient is a candidate for surgery and ortho, then you have to do the ortho first, then do the surgery, and then go back and fine tune with the ortho. 
The problem is, is that if you're thinking about surgery, in most cases, the orthodontics is in the opposite direction than if you're not going to be doing surgery. That you are augmenting the compensations so that the dentition of the mandible reflects the mandible, the dentitions of the maxilla reflects the maxilla, but they don't necessarily mix in three planes of space. But then when you do the surgery, they all mesh together. If you're doing orthodontics, and then the orthodontist says, well, this is going to be doing surgery, that most often gets to be a problem because the movement of the teeth is in the opposite direction than if you were to plan surgery to begin with. So I would be very careful about that. Well, that's kind of the old axiom that if you're going to get an A in anything in dentistry, get it in the diagnosis and treatment plan. You know, there might, yes, diagnosis, most important. It is, and it's, it's absolutely the most important. Everybody's in so big of a hurry to learn how to do something, they forget that deciding whether or not it needs to be done is the far bigger decision. Well, that goes to doing implants. It goes to taking out third molars and wisdom teeth. You know, if you do extractions, the best time to take out a wisdom tooth is someone who is in their late teens or early 20s. If I have a patient that comes in that's 50 and 60 years of age, that bone is harder. Is more dense bone, more cortical, not cancellous. I'm going to say, mm, I don't know. Do I really want to do that case? What percent of your practice is implants versus exodontia? When I started doing implants, it was at the time where the dentoalveolar portion of it was decreasing and the orthognathic surgery was decreasing as well as trauma. And very quickly, up until the time that I recently sold my practice, implants were probably about 90% of the revenue. <coughs> Unbelievable, so you sold your practice? Sold my practice almost four years ago, five years ago. And are you still going in there now? No, and uh, the office is not there, but I'm still practicing and still teaching and we're still running lots of courses, uh, didactic, model courses, life surgical courses. Uh, one of the surgical courses I teach is that uh, either in uh, Minnesota or in California, if you have a license to practice, I'll take six doctors, six dentists. And we provide the patients. The dentist then gets to do the surgery. And uh, but I, my job is to select the patient for the skill and expertise of the doctor and they spend two or three days doing surgery, as well as diagnosis and treatment where, where can the listener get more information about that? If they go to my webpage, go to smiler.net, they'll find out all the information about what to do for uh, workshops, for lectures, and for live surgery. Well, you're a legend in my mind and everyone else's. Thank you so much for spending an hour with me. It was fantastic. My pleasure. All right, all right. thank you very much. Hey, go to www.howardforran.com and get a copy of my new book, Uncomplicate Business. I went through every monthly column I had written from 1994 to 2015, and I looked at those columns and realized that in business, you only manage three things, people, time, and money. So I stripped out all the dental and wrote a book that could take any business to the next level. I don't care if you're a dairy farmer, own a restaurant, you're a plumber, this book is for you. Pre-order my book now. Get your copy at howardforran.com.